All right, folks, welcome in to the best practices of campaigns and automation. This is the uh, one of the last installments of our 2022 best practices uh, webinar series. And today, this little mini series is focusing on email marketing. So before we get into a bit about Keystone Click and what we do, thought we'd introduce ourselves. So my name is Spencer. I am the Director of Client Experience at Keystone Click. Um, do a lot with our internal CRM system in terms of marketing automation, email campaigns, building workflows, so on and so forth. Really so excited to share with you some of the tips and tricks I've learned along my time um, working within um, email campaign systems. So Lori, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Lori Hybe, I am the CEO and founder of Keystone Click. We are in our 14th year of business. Very exciting. Number 15 is, is right around the corner. We're going to plan something big for that. But um, back, my background is heavily involved in, in all digital aspects. Um, I started out doing a lot of work with um, search engine optimization and websites, and um, we've evolved um, to be more strategic with the whole um, ecosystem when it comes to, to digital. So Keystone Click is a strategic digital marketing agency. We help our clients build brand awareness and generate leads online. We do that by first collecting insights and data um, by conducting research on behalf of our clients to help them better understand their customer. And then we develop a full strategic plan that's focused on the very specific goals of our clients, and we support the implementation of that entire plan. Couldn't have said it better myself, almost like you've had 14 years to perfect that. It's been a work in progress, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. All right, moving into two. Oh, we have Lori, I believe this is you. Sure is. So as Spencer mentioned, we've got our whole series 2022 was all about the best practices. First quarter, we went heavy in content creation. Second quarter, we talked a lot about search engine optimization. Third quarter was website design and development. And this quarter, we're talking heavily around email. All of these are available on demand by simply going to keystoneclick.com forward slash webinars to access any past recordings. Tons of amazing content. If you've watched before, we focus heavily on giving you as much information as possible to help you better understand and potentially implement on your own. For sure. And because the chat's been a little wonky, I'll make sure that we send this in the follow-up uh, recording email so you guys can have the access to the link if you want to check that out. Anywho, moving into today's agenda, and it would not be a webinar. You have the ability to send it to everyone. I sure did. <laughs> Interesting. I don't. Okay. Like only sent to us balance. Anywho, um, moving into today's agenda. So we're going to overview a bit of what we covered in last webinar, which was list segmentation, you know, being more targeted in your campaigns by segmenting your list. And a bit about pairing segmentation with automation, which is going to be what we get into today when it comes to automating your email campaigns. Um, we're going to talk, dive into the email campaign side of things, what they are, what are the benefits, the types of email campaigns. You've got nurture, um, retention, re-engagement, drippy campaigns. Uh, talk about how you can use automation to deliver those campaigns, creating those effective automations and workflows, save you time and create more engaging campaigns. Uh, Going to talk a bit about how to craft those engaging emails, how to craft effective emails for um, your drip campaigns. Then get into a bit on campaign tracking, reporting, how you can use A-B testing to constantly be optimizing your campaigns. Uh, talk about landing page optimization as that typically plays a big part in email campaigns. You got to send them somewhere. And last but not least, it's not specifically our, a drip campaign or an email campaign, but we're going to talk a bit about email newsletters, best practices, and how you can provide the most value to your email subscriber list. So I think that covers it. Anything else, Lori? No, this is a lot of information we're going to share. Hopefully you can just grab at least one or two golden nuggets that are going to help you be better with your email marketing activities. 100%. So moving into a bit about what we covered last webinar. So just a bit on email marketing. I'm sure you've heard of it, familiar with it, but it's really about the process of targeting your audience and um, your customers through email and really about growing that brand awareness of your products, services. Um, so we talked a bit about targeting your audience last webinar when it came to segmentation, about how that segmentation allows you to be more targeted. So let's talk about how you can use email campaign to grow your brand awareness. So 
First things first is you want to use it to build relationships. It's really about establishing that rapport with your customers, showcasing that thought leadership and establishing that trust so that you can show that you are the expert in the field and that they are more likely to purchase for your services or become a client. Um, boosting your brand awareness, as I mentioned before, it's a great outlet to have those constant touch points with your audience. And the more touch points you have, the more they're going to be aware of your brand. Promoting your content. So that's going to be anything from product services to any, you know, you put an informational piece on your website, a blog, or you've got a white paper, an infographic that you really want to share. So using that as a tool to send it directly to your audience as opposed to posting on social media. Um, lead generation, which we're going to talk about when it comes to drip campaigns, being a bit more targeted um, or selected around a, or a bit more around an offering, generating those leads, conversions, um, marketing your products and services, which you mentioned before, and nurturing your leads. And that just gets back into those constant touch points, making sure that you're always in their ear, um, staying in front of them, maybe not in their ear, but staying in front of them at the very least. In their um, inbox. Staying yeah, in, in their inbox. So. <laughs> That's a bit about email marketing. Um, got the meme over there once again. Uh, so let's get into a bit about what we covered last webinar as well with list segmentation. So list segmentation is really about breaking your existing or contact list into smaller bite-sized pieces based around you know similar traits your contact list might have. So I've got a few examples over there that we'll get into, but you know the more specific your segments are the more targeted you can be in your campaigns, which would be what we talk about today. You know, if you've got more specific segments, if you've got more of a specific audience you're talking to, you can send them content that better fits their needs, that applies to their situation, that better speaks to their pains and goals, which at the end of the day is going to lead to you experiencing more growth and more conversion, more benefits. So talk a bit about these ways to segment industry. It's one of the most simple and easiest ways. So if you've got a few different target audiences, Segmenting them into separate lists based on what industry they are in allows you to better um, send them to content, as I mentioned before. Geography. If you've got different markets in different locations, maybe you're Midwest-based, so you've got your Illinois target audience, you've got your Missouri, or I guess Missouri, not really Midwest, but Minnesota, Iowa, grouping them all into separate ge geographic areas. Um, personas. So that's interesting. It's kind of a little bit about building that you know, target ideal client for your business. So anyone who fits that ideal client can be grouped into a certain persona um, and segmented based on that. Product interest, what certain products or services they have interest in um, can send them content related to that. What sales funnel stage they are, you know, are they early in the stage sales funnel? Are they just, have they just been um, reached out to or have they had a proposal presented to them? Um, another way to group and send content that better fits their needs. Website behavior, where they've been on your website, what pages they've visited, um, demographics, male, female, so on and so forth. And then engagement, you know, what are they engaging with your emails? Are they engaging with your social content? All of those are different examples of how you can segment your list to be a bit more targeted. Yeah, I so, want to, let's go back for what we're real quick, sure. actually. I want to just talk about a couple of those for like examples. So like the persona, um, a really good example would be, let's say it's the owner of a company that you're speaking to. You're going to typically speak to the owner of the company a little bit differently than you may be speaking to like the marketing manager of the company or maybe the buyer of the company, because those individuals have different types of goals and objectives that they're trying to fulfill. And that's where segmenting by the persona can be extremely beneficial. You're getting the message to the same company, you're just segmenting who's receiving that message and what is that core message that's being communicated to them. Yeah, that's a great point, Laura. It's really about providing that message, personalized content that best fits your audience's needs. So let's talk about email campaigns a little bit. And basically this is a planned um, series or sequence of emails that are going out to a very specific um, defined lists, especially around a segmented list. And typically it's used to continue to build and nurture those relationships. Um, one of the things that actually I'm going to have Spencer talk through. So we leverage email campaigns every time we have a webinar that we're pushing out. So there's a very specific series um, that Spencer does. He's the one that wears this hat, <laughs> as he talked about earlier. So Spencer, why don't you talk to um, what is it that you send out the frequency and like how many emails go out for every single 
webinar that we we produce. Yeah, yeah. So um, as Lori mentioned, I do wear that hat of kind of uh, working on the automations for our webinar emails. So if you've got complaints, take them up with me. But as <laughs> how it works is there's going to be a series of three promotional emails, and we're going to be sending that to a list of contacts who have already expressed interest in our webinar. So the first one's going to be going out the week before the webinar, and then two more, one on Monday, the week of, and then the last one on Wednesday, um, the same week of the webinar. So the way it works is let's say someone clicks on the link for a promotional email, signs up for a webinar. We've got automation. We're going to get into this deeper later, but it essentially triggers the form submission being tr triggers a confirmation email saying, thank you for signing up. Here are your calendar links, yada, yada, yada. So from there, they're automatically added to a list of folks who have either subscribed to the series as a whole or have signed up for that specific webinar. And so essentially we'll be sending reminder emails, which I'm sure you guys have all got complete with the tip sheet, so on and so forth. So that's a bit of how email campaigns can look and our example for the webinars. When you're looking at email campaigns, um, you definitely wanna look at the strategy and what it takes to map out. So Spencer talked about one week before the day before and then you know hour before basically and that's just having a plan on based on the specific activity that's happening and maybe it is time sensitive such as our um, webinars happen at a very specific time but if it's not time sensitive it's just more that nurturing you still want to have a plan as far as what is the frequency that you're putting the message out there and then how many um, you know what is the message that's being communicated and how many times are you getting in front of them? So um, we've done some campaigns where um, I like to call it like a re-engagement campaign where we're getting back in front of someone. And we do this with a number of our clients where they have a list that they haven't touched in a while. They haven't um, sent any emails out. So let's, let's warm that list up again. And so we'll typically do about five to seven emails. And we don't wanna do an email a day that can be overwhelming, especially if someone hasn't heard from you, but from a strategic standpoint, maybe we'll touch base with them every two to three weeks. And you wanna focus on um, personalizing that message so that you're speaking to them. And that's where having the personas is actually very helpful. Again, the example of speaking to the CEO versus like the marketing manager or the director of sales or whomever those, those individuals are, but also making sure that you're adding value in your message. So you don't wanna just go straight for the sales pitch because you're gonna lose that that um, that interested party. You wanna focus on value. And what's really important is having a strong subject line. And I know we're gonna talk about that a little bit further on. Um, but having these types of campaigns where you have a, a series of messages that's going out is ultimately going to improve your conversions because um, I know personally, and this is just um, backed by data as well, that maybe that first email someone doesn't open, but if they see your name a second time, a third time, a fourth time, one of those emails is gonna ultimately open. So the frequency and the consistency of getting a message out ultimately improves that open rate and conversion rate. Perfect. So let's talk about some types of email campaigns. Yes, so one of them that we really like to do is the lead nurturing campaign. So this is basically, when, um, as Spencer said, like you, someone has expressed some sort of interest. They've they've raised their hand. They've you've collected their information, so you're able to then put some more valuable information in their inbox to continue to nurture that lead along. Um, I know when we we're talking about different ways to segment, uh, a great opportunity with lead nurturing campaigns is to pay attention to where they are in the sales funnel and really understanding that maybe this is just a high level, hey, I raised my hand, I'm interested, or maybe you've had some sort of like a, a demo of the product or you've, you've noticed that they've been navigating your website and then spent X amount of hours on your site so then you can move them along through the sales funnel process. But the beauty of all this is it can all be automated within any sort of um, marketing automation system that based on the activities of the individuals on your list, you can have certain um, messages be pushed out automatically. One of the things that I do want to um, talk about with regards to email um, compared to like leveraging Facebook or, or Twitter or any other social channel is that 
um, there's about a 40 times more effective um, conversion and customer acquisition with email. And typically, um, any sort of automated emails actually see about 120% higher click-through rate than a manually sent email. So I just find that fascinating. Yep, and that's why they say that email marketing's got the best ROI. <laughs> Um, another type of email campaign, this one I'm a big fan of, is the onboarding or welcome type of email. So if you sign up for something or you, you joined a, a new website or a new program, you have a new client, new customer, um, a best practice is to welcome them. And um, what that's going to do is help minimize any sort of buyer's remorse. And it does prove to um, improve overall customer satisfaction. So some of the things to think about, um, the types of emails that go into some sort of a welcome campaign, which again is a series of emails, is that initial welcome, you're super excited, they've made a great decision, their life's gonna be easier and better now because they're a part of your club or whatever the organization is, they, they're buying into your service, your product. Um, if you have some sort of online database or profile, you wanna encourage them to complete filling that out so that you can better serve them or fill out whatever that, um, you know, survey or, you know, new client onboarding uh, process is. Give them some uh, helpful resources and tools. Um, think about like the FAQs that you get, um, any sort of log how to log into their account or educational information on how to best work with you um, and help them participate in some sort of um, communication. If you've got like a Facebook group or something along those lines, those are the types of things that you should include in that um, welcome email. Some additional stats related to that onboarding and, and kind of welcome email series. 76% um, of people actually expect to receive some sort of welcome email immediately after they've subscribed to any sort of list. So if you're not doing that, you definitely want to consider that because people are expecting it. The other thing that uh, I think is fascinating is that users that receive that welcome email, about 33% more likely to engage with your brand, not just in the inbox, but on other channels as well. Yeah, definitely. And I would compare that a lot to when you guys signed up for the webinar itself, you know, you immediately get that email. Here's the confirmation. Be a little weird if you sign up for a webinar and you don't get anything after. So just another example of kind of a welcome type of campaign. So moving on. Yeah. Another one um, that I'm definitely a fan of here uh, is the shopping cart abandonment. So um, basically, if you have some sort of an e-commerce site where someone, you know, signing up for a class, putting stuff into a cart, but then they're not hitting that checkout button and completing the transaction. If you have any sort of um, activity that reminds them that there's items in the cart and some people tend to maybe add an additional discount code, like, hey, if you check out now, get another 10% off, or just reminding them that those products are in the cart. Um, there is, there's definitely data that says, you know, the frequency of reminding and nudging them improves the overall conversion rate of those abandoned carts. Um, in addition, um, you can consider some sort of cross-selling or upselling. So you're encouraging someone and saying, you know, people that bought this also bought that type of messaging. Um, and that last one with regards to kind of winning back or what we referred to as that re-engagement campaign and, and looking back at past customers, especially in the e-commerce space saying, you know, hey, we haven't seen you in a while. Um, here's a discount code to consider um, buying or re-engaging with us. For sure. So let's move into a bit about drip campaigns. So drip campaigns are going to be a bit more focused on a specific offering or with a specific conversion as the end goal. So um, by definition, it was just a specific and automated set of emails that are going to go uh, out automatically based on the either the timeline or the actions of the recipient of the email. So we've kind of got that example over there. You know, they either we'll just picture all those being emails. You know, they've got any emails. Do they click the link? Do they sign up? Yes, no. And that really dictates di dictates what the next action is. So really allows you to one produce more um, personalized content stay top of mind with those consistent touch points and increase your engagement so i think we've got another picture whoops there it is but those are just some of the benefits folks have experienced from drip campaigns using them to automate their campaigns um open rate 
click throughs, so on and so forth. Those are the experience that marketers have. So here are a few situations of when and where to use drip campaigns. So promoting offerings, if you've got a specific offerings, let's say um, a special, if you've got a discounted product or service, that would be the time to use um, a drip campaign. Or if you want to use a targeted campaign like you've got with your segments, you've got a specific persona you want to target or a specific industry or a specific geographic area, that would be a great time to use a drip campaign to get them highly targeted information. Shopping cart abandonment, which Lori mentioned earlier, um, your typical email ca campaigns as well as assigning tasks. That's one of the neat things about um, marketing automation doing drip campaigns is not only is it sending emails, but it can also be used to notify either, let's say, a salesperson that someone completed a certain action or a marketing person that they, once again, complete a certain action. Just really allows everyone to be in the loop throughout the entire process with those consistent touch points. And then when it's time, you know, bring that actual personalized email to an account. Okie dokie. Moving on. Let's talk about automations and creating workflows for your um, campaigns. So essentially what a workflow is going to look like is those examples from the other slides. It's going to all going to start off with either a trigger or an initial email directed at an audience. And that's just going to go from there. So first step for any automation that you create is going to be identifying that target audience. So that could be your email segment, which we talked about last webinar. So identifying who you want to send this email to, who it's going to be directed at, who's going to find the most value in it and really making sure you've got that nailed down and you've got that audience segmented into a list that you're gonna be saying that to. Second would be to develop valuable content. Um, Lori will advocate for this, but content is king when it comes to any marketing initiative. So whether it's a blog content or a white paper content, just make sure you've got great content that can be easily translatable from its current location to email content. Um, you really want to identify the entry point for your email campaign. So that's going to be the trigger. And we're going to talk about that a bit more. So it could either be that they've entered a list or it could be that they've completed a form, so on and so forth. So those are just some examples about the trigger. Um, fourth is identifying your call to action. So this is the goal of the campaign. This is what you want people to do. Um, and like I said, with drip campaigns, it's going to be specific to a service or offering. So Really make sure that your call to action is consistent throughout those emails and all relating to the call to action or the service or product. Um, and last but not least, you need to map out the actions you want to take place. So if there's an email to be sent, what happens if they click the link to a piece of content that you share, but not to the landing page of the product or service? What happens then? Or you can just make it simple. You know, email one goes out, then there's a time delay. Email two goes out so on and so forth. They can really be as simple or as complex as you'd like them to be. But mapping it out is always a great first step. Well, and what I'd say two really important things with mapping it out is to start with the end in mind. What is the ultimate end objective that you want to happen? And then kind of reverse engineer um, all the way up into that entry point, as opposed to starting at the entry point. It's going to be a lot easier to think about that end result that says, okay, we want them to sign up for this workshop, what happens right before they sign up for the workshop? They're at a landing page. And then how do they get there? They saw this first email. Okay, what happens if, um, you know, how do they get to that first, that one email? So you just keep working backwards and that's going to help you to build the whole campaign. Yeah. Um, there was another point I had with that and I lost it, but definitely yeah. start with the end in mind. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say having the end in mind helps cultivate a journey that's more cohesive as opposed yeah. Otherwise, you can get some clunkiness. So start from the end, work back, but make sure you know your audience is a great first step. So moving on to some types of triggers. So social media engagement, did they engage with posts? Did they share a post? Interactions with your website, you know, have they filled out a form on your website? You know, if they fill out a contact us form, what happens after that? Um, attributes you design, do you define? So these would be your Personas, if someone fill or someone falls under that um, company owner persona, or if it's a geographic area that someone lives within, um, really, what, what you'll figure out what your email marketing system offers. You just got to really take a deep dive and figure out what fits best with your audience. 
Um, then, as I mentioned before, filling out a form. You know, in our case, you've got the webinar form, which triggered an email campaign. Um, but you can also be a contact us form, request a quote form, a, a shopping cart or a checkout form, so on and so forth. And then that goes back to the shopping cart abandonment. You know, did they purchase or not purchase? Yes or no? Um, yeah, with, with all actions, basically, or triggers or any of those types of statements, you have to really think about if what statement, if then statements, if this happens, then what happens? If this doesn't happen, then what happens? And that's yep. really how you're building out the whole workflow. Fantastic. So we got your triggers and now we've got your action. So after the trigger, something needs to happen. Typically with your drip campaigns and email campaigns, it's going to be an email and the image to the right. It is an example from our marketing automation tool called Sharp Spring. Um, it really offers tons of different options when it comes to triggers um, as well as actions. So as you can see on the right, we've got send the email. Um, then you've got notify someone by email. In this case, why would it be beneficial? It could be beneficial in the event that someone fills out a form for a special offer, because then it would be great to have that personal touch with a personalized email. You know, thank you for this and follow, or to follow up on it. It can add or remove someone to a list, just like I mentioned with our webinars. If someone fills out the form, that will add them to a list um, with everyone who signed up for that specific webinar. So that's an example of that. Um, it could change someone's status or update their information. So let's say you've got a form that has some more information on it. If they fill it out, you know, maybe they add their company name that can automatically be added along with it. Or it can create a task for a salesperson as well, which is kind of what I got into with that notify someone by email, just letting someone know, um, letting someone from the company know that this happened and so that they're aware of the, uh, the occasion that what next steps are. Um, some of those other actions are listed over there, but those are some of the main ones on the left. Fantastic. Let's talk about some of the best practices that we recommend following and that we've found the most success with when crafting email campaigns. So as I mentioned before, um, this kind of gets back to our last couple of slides, but as I mentioned before, a drip campaign is set into motion when the contact completes a specific action or they are grouped into a specific segment. Um, which will serve as the campaign's trigger. Um, so the first step would be to create that trigger, create that action, and depending on what they do for the email or what the recipient, what the action they take, that will determine the next step. And the, the image on the right does a nice job to, of outlining it. So let's say you send a thank you for signing up email and you've got three links on it. I'm not gonna specify what they are because I'm not positive, but depending on what link they choose, that can either be the end of the road, or it could take them to another campaign. So that's just a bit of example. And as Lori mentioned, um, it's really about thinking with the end goal in mind. So what is that end goal? What is that end call to action that you want these folks to be um, completing and then working back and building that automation to fill that goal? Moving on to what to craft and what how to build effective emails. And Lori will probably have a lot to add on this because he is very knowledgeable when it comes to this, but you guys value that. regardless of what content you're pushing out there in the digital landscape, you've got to be adding content, uh, adding value. So what does that look like? Providing industry knowledge, you know, linking to a blog, a news piece that they might find interesting relating to the audience's needs, so on and so forth. Really just providing them with anything new, um, new information that they didn't have before that showcases your thought leadership is a great example of value add. And make sure that the value add is relevant to the end goal. So it relates to either the product, service, offering that you're trying to get them to um, convert on. Um, you yeah, the value, yeah, the value adds. Um, think about the FAQs again. What are the questions that people are often asking you? Mm -hmm. And that is the valuable information that you can provide in the form of an email, because likely someone else is thinking about that same question as well. Yeah, for sure. And so the next point is just don't write in big, long, drawn out paragraphs. People don't want to read essays when they get emails. They want to read short paragraphs to the point. You know, if you've got opportunities to add um, bullet points, small lists, that's also great. Just keeping your paragraphs as concise as possible, which kind of gets into the next one. Write conversationally. And this is a big challenge for a lot of folks be just because they want 
they're knowledgeable to the topic. So it's easy to write in those expert terms using high level language. But really what you want to do is act like you're just talking to someone who doesn't know about what you do at your business. Keep it very basic, conversational, be personal, personable, um, really avoid that heavy industry jargon. So don't be throwing around terms. I'm trying to think of a really advanced marketing term, but you know, so on. So you get, you get the idea and avoid large, um, avoid large media items as well, just because that can result in you being sent to a spam, their spam inbox, which can affect your sender status. Um, compelling subject line, which I'm going to let Lori talk about what makes. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that actually. Yep, so, I, I mean, if you think about it, you, people are opening emails based on two reasons. One, the sender, they've already established trust with the sender or two, the subject line. And that subject line has to be so compelling, um, especially if they don't know who the sender is, that it makes them want to open it. Ultimately, people are going to click based on two things. The subject line is either connecting with them on an emotional level or an intellectual level. So just saying, and this is one of my personal pet peeves, and it drives me nuts because I see so many people do this, you know, November newsletter is the subject line. There's nothing about that that encourages me to want to open it. It has to be something of value. Talk about what the person can expect to read when they once they open up that email. So again, it needs to connect with them on some sort of an emotional or intellectual level for them to want to click the link, especially when it's coming from someone that they do not have any sort of established trust with already. For sure. That's why I passed job to Lori because she knows. <laughs> um, moving on, but try to create urgency, especially if you've got a time bound offering. Urgency is your best friend. So after you provide that value, any way you can create some level of urgency that leads into the call of action, like offer ends, yada, yada, yada. Don't say it exactly like that. Find a way to say it more conversationally, but any way you can create some sense of urgency is more likely to garner a click through or a click through the landing page. And that gets into an effective call to action as well. Make sure that at the end of your email, you've got a strong call to action. You know, one that tells them exactly what's going to happen once they click that, whether it be a link, or a button. So really make sure that it takes them to the location that the call to action makes it look like they're being sent to and that it is encouraging people to click it. Um, last but not least, we talk about a PS statement and that is, what that looks like is what we also call a super signature. So it goes underneath your typical email signature and it's three or four bullets. And what these bullets contain are just additional value adds or offering. So typically the way we look at it is the first two bullet bullets are going to be freebies. So this could either be a, hey, check out this blog on yada, yada, yada with a link to the blog or sign up for our webinars or subscribe to our newsletter. Just freebies that um, don't require too much opt-in. Um, then the next ones are typically more surrounded by your offering. You know, check out our products, check out our services. We've got this special offering. We've got these workshops. So typically those next one or two bullets are more related to um, uh, specific offerings are more of an option. I think we've got an example image right here. Um, so yeah, so ready to maximize your biz business potential, free monthly newsletter. Um, yeah, those are kind of two of them are a bit more opt-ins. We'd like to see more of a um, value add, but you know, so on and so forth. You guys get the idea. Um, so let's talk about optimizing your drips. So likewise, with any marketing efforts, it's not going to be perfect right away. Um, you're going to want to set up goals for your emails. And Lori's going to get a bit into how to set up these goals, how to measure, uh, so on and so forth in a second. So this is just going to be high level. But you're going to want to use your email marketing systems reporting um, to gauge analytics to see how you're doing in terms of achieving your goals. You know, how many people are opening it? Are people going to the landing page? So on and so forth. Um, and what you're going to want to do from there is use A-B testing, which Lori is also going to talk about, to make edits and update your emails, or maybe it's the frequency that you're sending the emails, just based on what the, what the data is telling you. Um, what you're also going to, get, going to want to do is test out your drips on different contact list segments to see if a specific campaign is more effective with a different group of people. Um, and, the way, and that is just really beneficial to see you know, what's resonating with certain people, what's not, and how can it be optimized going forward. So I'm going to pass it back off to Lori now. Yeah, when we're talking about um, email 
um, campaigns. There's a couple of things that are important. You can move on to the next slide here, Spencer. Um, first and foremost, with any marketing, not just email campaigns, but it's really important to get clear before you start anything on what is the end goal that you're trying to achieve. And um, we always like to structure these in the form of SMART goals. And what this allows is for you and anyone that you're working with to understand and be on the same page as to what success looks like before you even start working on things. So if you want to say by you know January 31st, um, we're going to have we're going to increase our inbox uh, or our email list size by 20%. Um, that is considered a smart goal. Or we're going to um, increase our open rate by um, to 50% by this date. You know, it's just get, this is what we're going to do at, within this time frame is going to make it easier to say, yes, we achieved our goal or no, we did not achieve our goal. Mm -hmm. And once you get clear on what it is that you're trying to achieve, then you want to look at how are we going to measure these items to make sure that we are indeed on track to achieve our goal, um, or there's some things that we need to tweak to help us make sure we are um, achieving our goal. So when it comes to email, any sort of email marketing, these are the typical um, KPIs or key performance indicators that we like to take a look at. Open rate is pretty obvious. That's um, the size of your list divided by the number of people that actually open the email. So if your list size is 100 and 50 of those people open the email, your open rate is 50%. Now the click through rate is those people that opened the email and then actually clicked on a link. So it's really important to have some sort of link or call to action as Spencer talked about in your email so that you can see are people engaging with the email um, more than just opening it and reading it. So for example, we were at 50 people opened it and let's say that um, 10 of those people clicked on it. So then your click through rate would be 20%. Now the conversions are really what's happening at that next step. So are they filling out a form? Are they downloading something? Did someone um, click the, the phone number to call you? And so that's whatever that action is that you're looking for them to do, that's considered a conversion. Now a bounce rate means that you had an email on your list that actually did not work. And so that means that um, the, the the email bounced back, um, but you can also look at it as a website, meaning someone clicked through to something and then just hit the back button right away. Unsubscribe is pretty straightforward, and that means someone is asking to be removed from your list, and you have to honor that. Um, and then whatever your specific goals are. So if you're looking to increase your website traffic and you're leveraging email, you can actually track to say, well, 20% of our website traffic increase came from our email marketing activities. Um, so that's another uh, way that you can kind of tie your bigger picture marketing goals and how email is a part of that. Yeah, definitely. And as we move into this next slide, which is going to be about A-B testing, it's going to be important to know what these analytics relate to when it comes to a specific email. So open rate, as Lori mentioned, that's either going to be the subject line or if they know you're not. So if your open rate's low, that could mean that you need an update on your subject line, click through rate. If that's low, it might mean that you need to have a more specific call to action. Maybe you need to change where the button is or um, where it's located, what the words are within the call to action. Um, conversions, that could be related to the landing page that you're sending folks to, which we're gonna to touch base on here in a second. But it's really important just to think about, you know, what the what it means when something might not be up to a certain, um, a certain level that you want it to be, and then making that adjustment, which Lori's going to talk about here. Yeah, so that's where A-B testing comes into play. And basically what you're doing is, um, we do this with a lot of our emails, um, and actually we do this specifically uh, with the subject lines when our open rates aren't um, exactly where they want to be. And this is a practice that we instill with all of our email marketing. Um, when an email is sent out and there are individuals who do not open the email. We actually resend the email with a different subject line to see if that increases the open rate, but that email is only sent to those who have not opened the email. Um, you can play with the, um, the word, uh, the positioning of the information, um, the language around the call to action. If there's, if it's just a static uh, text email or if there are some visuals in it, 
if the email is um, speaking to the individual. So hi, Spencer, or just um, removing any sort of initial um, greeting. And basically what you want to do is only change one variable at a time, because otherwise you don't know what is ultimately impacting the success of uh, the email. So one of the things that we do is we'll segment our list. So let's say, um, I know we did this uh, uh, not too long ago, we have about 200 emails on a very specific segmented list based on industry. And we actually chunked those emails into lists, um, 10 lists of 20 emails. And then we segment, we pushed out the messages at different variables to then test um, one variable at a time. And then we were able to tweak and figure out what version of that email ultimately had the greatest success um, so that the next time we are gonna send to the greater list, we have um, um, higher results to be to target. For sure. So let's talk a bit about landing page optimization. So once someone clicks through a specific email in your drip campaign, it's taken them to a landing page more than likely. So let's talk about how you can work to drive some conversions. And what you're gonna notice is that a lot of these are gonna be similar to a lot of the best practices for the email itself. So having that clear call to action, making sure if they fill out a form or they click to a button that they know where that's gonna take them next. Um, using power words or adjectives, um, really using those power, keeping words to a minimum, but making sure they're impactful, um, help to drive conversions and help to build your credibility. Um, answer your objections. This one might seem odd, but answer the object objections that people might be having on the landing page itself. So um, I'm trying to think of an example here, but uh, if someone has concerns about, you know, you've got a workshop, so not well, sure. Am I the right person to attend this workshop? Yes. Yeah. Say, this workshop is best for, and then list the type of people that are on it. Thank you, Laura. That's exactly right. And then same thing, you know, include some testimonials as well, because that might, they might have that thought in their head, their head, this might not be right for me. Then once they said, you know, people have done this before they, it's been validated, that might help answer those objections as well. Um, make sure it's visually focused. So grab their attention with either it can be a video on the landing page, or it could just be um, a great header image. Just really make sure you grab the attention right away um, of your visitor. Yeah, so I've also read that, and there's studies that if you have a picture of a person that's smiling and their eyes are pointing towards that specific call to action, it can increase the conversion rate on that page. Interesting. Well, we're going to have to get the camera out here today and try that out. <laughs> Anyways, so some other best practices is, as I mentioned before, words to a minimum. So when it comes to your headline, that first thing that people see in terms of text, aim for six word headlines. Be straight to the point and really make sure you get your messages message across. And really, if you're not able to showcase the benefit, why people should do this in the six words or what it is, then it, it might not be worthwhile for them to do it. So really try to keep that text to a minimum. And then when it comes to the other text on the page, really be benefit focused. Tell them what they're going to get by signing up for this, what they're going to experience with your service, what they're going, how it's going to help them achieve their goals, um, so on and so forth. So really keep the focus on the benefit while answering their objections. Same thing as before, write conversationally. Um, try to keep it light, easy, um, not too salesy. So act as if you're talking to a prospective customer or just networking with someone, telling a family friend about the business and how you help people, because um, then it tends to come off more easy. So um, if you're having trouble with this, it, it never hurts to just record yourself talking. That's a strategy that we've implemented in the past is if you got a writer's block, just sit in front of a computer, hit the record button, and then transcribe it after the fact. Hear what sticks, hear what doesn't. Um, and then same with email. Avoid those large paragraphs and blocks of text. People don't want to read too much. Just keep it clear, concise, conversational. Um, and those are some best practices that'll help you improve those conversions. So that's about landing pages. Let's finish up with a brief touch on newsletters. Sure. So some best practices on your email newsletter, and this is typically where you have like that monthly message or there's a consistent cadence as far as the distribution of that. Some companies do daily newsletters, some do weekly newsletters. It really depends on you. I would say a minimum 
is once a month to maintain the following of that audience. Um, uh, as I talked about earlier, your subject line is going to really be what makes or breaks people clicking on the email and opening it and engaging with it. Um, especially in the newsletters, you want to be heavily focused on educational value add information with about 90% of the content being that value add and then 10% being that promotional. And usually that promotional is where it's going in that kind of super signature that Spencer talked a little bit earlier. This is an opportunity for you to highlight some of the current work that you're working on and just showcase kind of the, the different offerings that you have at your organization. Um, you want to think about not just having a newsletter that's spread to the masses, but you might want to consider having two versions of your newsletter. One is for people that are following you, but not yet considered clients or customers of you, and then have a different newsletter where you're speaking to your current clients and customers. And the reason you want to consider that is because you're going to speak a little bit differently to people that are already working and engaging with you than you are going to speak to those who are not yet um, committed to to working with you on some level. And then as I mentioned before, definitely resend that newsletter with a new subject line to those who have not yet opened your newsletter. And we'll typically do that about three or four days after the first newsletter is sent out. Fantastic. So let's close it off with a bit of a summary. So um, really email campaigns automations, they can be utilized at each stage of the customer journey, whether they are someone who is just on your email list you haven't touched base with in a while, or maybe they're an opportunity if you've lost base for a while. That's where we kind of brought up the re-engagement campaign. Maybe it's someone who filled out a form on your website and they're dumped into a nurturing campaign. Just really, they can always, anyone at any stage of the customer journey can be benefited from an email campaign with those frequent touch points, value as and personalized content. So as Lori mentioned, really start by mapping out the content, starting with that end goal, where you want people to go, um, the audience who you're targeting, um, what content you're going to be sending them that's related to the end goal, what the entry point for the campaign is, and how you're going to get them to click through to achieve that end goal. Um, really focus on adding values I mentioned before with some thing with some items that showcase your thought leadership that your that your audience will find interesting. Um, and write conversationally, avoiding that heavy jar heavy jargon language and just really like you're just talking to a family member, as I mentioned before. Um, make sure your call to action is clear and obvious and that when people click it, they know exactly where they're going and make sure that the your landing page is benefit focused while answering objections. Um, as Lori mentioned before, make sure that you utilize the data to conduct A-B testing and constantly be optimizing your drips, um, just like she gave with that example of where we broke our list of 200 folks into groups of 10, or 20, excuse me. But really just utilize any opportunity you can to segment and constantly be optimizing via what the data says, saying. So low open rate, it's gonna be your um, subject line, or if not even click-throughs, it could be your content or your call to action, but really just make sure you're focusing on one element at a time. And then the last key is start simple. Don't try to over, over complexify everything to start. Just really keep it simple, straightforward, um, so that you're con achieving those consistent touch points. Anything to add? No, I, I think you've done a great job summarizing this. Fantastic. So moving into our offering. Uh, so we're offering a free 30-minute strategy session to all of the folks who have joined and who have signed up for this webinar. Um, just as a thank you for sticking with us throughout this entire series as we're approaching the end. So um, we've got three topics that you can choose from, each with a kind of a personalized strategy session. So the first being search engine optimization. We're going to take a look at some keywords um, that you're ranking for, look at your current state, do a quick audit of that, um, look at keywords you could be ranking for, how, where your opportunities are to um, outrank your competition, and then come up with some content ideas that could be added to your website to boost your rankings. Um, moving on to website design and content, again, look taking a look at your website from a technical standpoint, a user friendliness standpoint, and taking that all together in an audit and really coming up with some actionable opportunity areas for you, as well as website content to add. And last but not least is social media. Really the end goal of that is to going to be to um, load you up with social media ideas that you can implement um, throughout all of your social media channels. So that sounds interesting to you. It looks like Lori's already thrown that in chat. 
Um, just make sure once you click on the link and if you sign up, specify which of the sessions you'd like to um, join us for, and we'll get that in motion. So anything to add to that, Lori? No, I think it's a, a great opportunity to get some free strategy from some of our internal experts. For sure. So I think that brings us to last but not least, what we've got coming up next. So as I mentioned before, we're approaching the end of our 2022 Best Practices Many Mini Series. I can't believe this year's gone by so fast. I know. <laughs> 11 webinars done, one to go. And the last one, we are going to take a deep dive into subject line. So Lori, I know that she scratched the surface today, but this one's just going to be deep dive on how you can increase your open rates and ensure people are seeing your subject line and it's piquing their interest so that they're opening your emails and what's that leading to? More conversions, more people clicking through, more engagement, more brand awareness. So um, definitely recommend you join us for that. Um, with the link that was thrown in the chat earlier, keystoneclick.com backslash webinars, you can check out our overarching landing page and sign up for that episode individually. And that'll be on December 15th. And then make sure you stay tuned for what we've got coming in 2023 because it's exciting. All right. And we'll open it up for any questions. Yeah, yeah, definitely feel free to throw any questions in the uh, Q&A section. It uh, looks like we do have one, and it's in relation to something that we touched on a bit, but um, haven't fully dove into, but it asks about the frequency of email campaigns. You know, how often should you be touching base? Because you mentioned not every day, but so how, what should that frequency look like of touch bases? I think it's really important to understand what's important to your customer. Again, talking about... Um, Starting with the end in mind, what is what is the goal that you're trying to achieve? If you've got um, a product that you're offering that's like a quick, you know, buy, 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 direct to consumer type thing, I would say increase the frequency. But if you're more of a long sales cycle, um, professional services or fairly expensive um, item, then I would spread out that frequency to be anywhere from, you know, two to three weeks to, to a month um, from a newsletter campaign. If it's more of a, a drip campaign, maybe every you know 10 to 14 days. Fantastic. Anyone else got any questions out there? Well, uh, feel free to reach out if you do. Um, and again, take advantage of that 30 minute strategy session. Uh, until next time, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for joining us, guys. Well, as Lori said, feel free to reach out anytime. And if you missed anything, feel free. Oh, it looks like we actually did get another question. So um, here we go. Um, Brett asked, um, how important is preview text for email marketing? Um, that's the first question. So if you want to answer that one, it's two sure. Well, the preview text, some email tools do give that teaser. And again, I would say that's no different than the impact of the subject line. So um, you could see when people forget to put that information in, you say, oh, preview text here, that just says that it's not doing it. So it's another way to add um, information about what's going to happen in the email. I think that's that's just as important as the subject line. Yeah, and then the next part is... Um... Notice that we that a lot of bigger corporations have been using um, emojis in their subject line. And is that a new trend? And I can start answering that as like, I have seen that. I think that there's some degree of email subject lines becoming a bit more casual, I would say, a bit more, you know, just, hey, instead of a bit more formal, a bit more casual. So I have seen a few of those. I'm not sure what Lori's thoughts would be on that. Well, just like what we're saying as far as the best practice in the body content of the email is to have, be conversational. And I think, you know, emojis are being used um, in everyday texting and on social media. So it only makes sense to incorporate it into, um, into the subject line. But I would caution to make sure that it aligns with your overarching brand and how you want to mm -hmm. be perceived. If you're not using emojis in anywhere else on your content, then it doesn't make sense to include it in the subject line. Think about how you want to be perceived, and then you have to be really careful about what specific emojis you're actually using. 100%. All right. Well, if you have either anyone has any additional questions, um, feel free to reach out to Lori or myself. Uh, our emails are listed right there. Um, as well as if you want to check out the recording, missed anything, we'll be 
in your inbox tomorrow morning. So I um, really appreciate you all joining us and I hope everyone has a fantastic rest of your Thursday and great weekend. All right. Bye.